Hello everyone, Kyle Bunger here, and it is finally time. Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2 has been out for over a month, and I have been making plenty of gameplay videos on it. I have not done a proper review of the game until now because I really wanted to make sure that I had my thoughts collected, and I wanted to see what the latest patch would change. But I'm ready, and I hope you're ready too. I want to throw out real quick before we begin that it would be awesome if you hit the like button, and make sure you subscribe if you like platform fighting game content in general. Thank you. Now if you are new to this channel, you might be wondering what exactly will make this review different from any other review. My answer is that uh, I play platform fighting games like constantly all the time and that's what my YouTube channel is all about. So yeah, uh, I'm coming at it from a perspective of somebody who has played these games ever since he was a little kid has played it casually a lot and has played these games uh, at a higher level extensively as well. Uh, not to the point where I'm like a top top player or something, but if I do play against top players, uh, maybe I can do some cool stuff here and there, I don't know. But yeah, they're probably gonna kick my butt. Let's start by getting this out of the way because if you've been living under a rock then you wouldn't know this, but Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2 is a much better game than the first in many ways. I'm not trying to invalidate Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 1 in any way. It's still a fun game with unique mechanics and it really turned itself around from its initial release in terms of the content of the game and character balance. But Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2 is objectively better in every way. Let's go over each aspect of the game one by one. Let's start with the most important aspect of any game, it's gameplay. Nickelodeon also Brawl 2 shares many game mechanics with the Smash Brothers games while introducing new mechanics inspired by other fighting games. Your objective is to knock your opponents off the stage and into off-screen blast zones that take a life away from your opponent. You have a light attack button, special button, a dedicated strong button, a jump button, a grab with four directional throws, and a shield button. Most of the other defensive options like spot dodges and rolls are taken from Smash as well. You have the ability to do 5 light attacks on the ground and in the air, 4 specials on the ground and in the air, and 3 strong attacks on the ground and in the air. This makes each character's moveset much bigger than they were in the first game, and even bigger than the movesets in Smash Bros. There's a nice design philosophy used for these extended movesets. Instead of making all Air Strong's KO moves for example, some of them move you up, down, or have much more range than their light attack counterparts. No one character in this game feels alike which is a great achievement in the moveset design of every character. To me, most of them are fun to play as. I do believe balance in a fighting game like this is important and is nowhere near perfect in this game. Some characters have oppressive moves or playstyles that can be hard to play around. Gameplay ultimately feels like it comes more down to how much you can mash a silly move instead of making actual good decisions over your opponent. However, there is a comeback factor in this game, and it is the mechanic that makes this game stand out from the rest. It is the slime meter, of course. This allows you to do so many things just with the press of a button during certain things. You have three bars of meter, and as you get more bars you have access to more options to turn the tide of battle, or keep it in your favor. At one bar of meter, you can do things like cancel moves, air dash, and enhance specials or strongs. At 2 bars a meter, you can burst out of an attack in order to stop yourself from being comboed or reaching the blast zone. At 3 bars a meter, you can do a super attack. These super attacks are small cinematics that do 40 damage and high knockback. This meter shines in allowing players to more freely express themselves by building strategies around meter. Most players will likely wait until they reach 3 bars to try and hit their super attack without thinking much about the other options. But at a high level of play, you have to figure out whether you want to use slime for offensive or defensive purposes. There are mechanics in place to prevent cheap KOs using slime at lower damage numbers. Still, there's not much stopping a highly skilled player from knocking you out after two combos at times, especially if they use slime to continue their combos. This is why I and many other people usually save meter for more defensive options like burst and slime enhancing specials to get back on the stage. The thing about this slime meter is that some characters in this game have good combos, good buttons that are hard to punish, and kill confirms without having to use meter. 
Therefore, those types of characters usually exclusively use meter for defense. And I think that is what makes a top tier in the game right now. The more a character can get away with only using bursts or enhancing recovery options, the better. It seems like a hard thing to balance, but I'm sure with some fine tuning in the future, every character can feel like they are about at the same level. Right now, Slime unfortunately does not feel like it changes much in the grand scheme of things at the most optimal level of play. I'd say this game has the same problem as Smash Ultimate, where a character with a good flow chart and moves that put you in 50-50 situations beat everything else, with not much wiggle room to adapt, even when Slime is a thing because your opponent can use it just as much as you can. I'd say at a high level this game is nowhere near fun to me. I guess that is a mute point because I've never really enjoyed top level play in any platform fighter, so maybe you would enjoy it in this game, I don't know. Stages in this game are varied. Some have no gimmicks, some do, and some even change dynamically throughout the match. There are also multiple variations of each stage, even some that are catered to competitive play. I think the only big complaint I have seen about the stages is that some of them have visibility issues for players. Some of them are too dark or some of them have flashing lights that photosensitive players have a hard time with. Items are here from the start and they do change the landscape of the match quite a bit. Some items return from the first game but not all of them, and there are plenty of new ones to use too. One odd thing that is still not in the game as I record this though, is the ability to choose how often items appear and which ones will appear. This was a feature in the first game so it feels missing here. Of course you can play with up to 4 players and do team battles. One thing omitted from the first game is the sports mode. There's probably a good reason for that, we'll discuss it next. The single player offerings in Nickelodeon Ultra Brawl 2 are some of the best you will get in the genre. The main offering that all the other offerings kind of borrow from is the campaign mode. The campaign mode is a roguelike where you go through a gauntlet of various challenges to reach a boss, and then once you beat that boss you move on to the next gauntlet until you reach the final boss. The final boss of campaign mode is Vlad Plasmius. He uses a mind controlling machine to try and take over the universe. It is up to you to stop him, but there are many twists in the story that encourage you to beat it multiple times in order to get a true ending. As roguelikes tend to do, there are temporary power-ups that you can collect on your run, as well as permanent upgrades that you can buy before going on a run. The upgrades on both ends do significant amounts of heavy lifting for any run you go on. Of course, as you play more, your permanent upgrades give you enough of an edge to breeze through the campaign even on the hardest difficulties. At least that's how it was for me. You can remove your permanent upgrades at any time, as well as decline getting any temporary ones to make things a true challenge. In this campaign mode, there's much more you can do besides doing regular fights. There are also fights with random enemies from various Nickelodeon series. They even change which ones you fight as you go through a run. Same thing goes for the minigames that you play. These include balloon popping, platforming sections, and robot smashing. You can even give yourself some health at Healing Fountains mid-run if you need to. It does feel like you have the opportunity to make each run different based on your current situation. The game does a decent job at giving the player a variety of options to choose from, but for me it took about 6 hours of playtime in the campaign before going on runs wasn't all that fun anymore. By platform fighting game standards, the fact that the game even had a campaign mode in the first place, and for it to be able to hook me for that long is an impressive feat. I think the campaign mode is worth your time if you like playing games of this genre. I haven't even gone over the fact that there seems to be an endless amount of dialogue within this mode, unlockable skins, and additional fun things like the ability to decorate the hub world of this mode. Now there are standalone ways to play the mini games from this mode, and you can also do a boss rush against all the bosses too. The only other mode that offers something a bit different from the campaign is arcade mode. If you have played classic mode in Smash or arcade mode in other fighting games, this is what this is. You fight in a series of battles. Some of them are themed around certain characters or alternate costumes that they have, but they are just standard battles that are broken up by two boss fights and a mini game. It's nothing crazy, but it's a nice way to experience what the game has to offer in a short burst. Again, overall, the single player offerings in this game are better than most games in the genre, and it can be quite fun, but still not enough to justify a $50 price tag alone either. 
So if you've been thinking about paying for the game without it being on sale, just keep that in mind. Your playtime and the value of this game is mainly going to be dependent on how much you want to play online, just like most fighting games. Before I get into the online though, there are still a couple of things I want to go over and it shouldn't take too long to do. The roster in this game to me is about as good as the first games. There are plenty of noticeable exclusions from the first game and the roster size is the same as the first games for now. I think that the new characters that have been added are cool, but nothing too crazy either. There are some iconic picks and some obscure picks, but overall every character has something unique to offer and their designs make their inclusions justified. Still, I wouldn't say that this is like an all-star roster or anything. If you really take a look at just the characters that we have on offer, including the DLC, just for face value, uh, it's not like the greatest roster they could possibly conjure up, but I still think that every character in this game is fun, so I guess that's all that really matters. Let's talk about the graphics in this game. I think that the graphics in this game are great. What shines for me are the character models. They are very expressive and most of the time they perfectly mimic the ways the characters look in their shows. That is impressive because some models in Nickelodeon games have looked awful in the past. Taking Danny as an example, his 3D models from past Nickelodeon games looked completely off from how he looked in the show for many years. When Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 1 released, it had the best Danny model that we had seen, but he still looked a bit off. But in Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2, he looks spot on. I can't really think of any particular instance where a character looks weird in this game, but maybe you could point out one if you really looked. The animation in this game is so much better than the first game. You can actually see startup frames on many animations. Most of them feel like they have some weight behind them and it's great to see. It's not perfect, but it's pretty exceptional most of the time. Every stage in this game is pretty, and locations do vary quite a bit, as I touched on earlier. The voice acting in this game is amazing. Every character is full of personality while they fight, and you can really hear them shine in the campaign mode. The only downside is that you'd have to restart campaign mode a bunch of times if you want to hear all the voice lines. But yeah, every character is voice acted, they all have a ton of lines to listen to, and some of the stuff that comes out of their mouths is perfection. My favorite quote in this game has to be Plankton's STOP JUMPING! STOP! I COMMAND IT! STOP JUMPING! I wanted to talk about bugs real quick. Unfortunately, there are a lot of them. Even after a couple of patches, there's still a couple bugs in the game and if anything, patches have actually brought in more bugs. Many of them are tied to supers as far as I can tell, which is not good. But outside of the ones I have seen caused by supers, I haven't seen anything game breaking that hasn't been patched at this point. Um, never mind, I have found something pretty bad, <laughs> of course. Uh, I jinxed it. But as you can see, right, I've played campaign mode five times, but there's this very weird uh, bug right now where um, I just went online, I was gold three, now I'm silver three, uh, and I don't have a lot of the banners, frames, icons, medals that I unlocked through campaign mode either. A lot of stuff that I had unlocked is now showing as locked and my rank went down and it seems to be some kind of like save corruption thing going on. Uh, here I'm gonna show that I don't have any alternate costumes from the campaign mode and you guys have seen me unlock them throughout this video uh, in clips throughout the video so it's like yeah I don't know. Um, I just want to make a quick PSA about this in particular because um, it really would not be good if any of you guys encountered this. I personally don't care too much about my online rank or the badge system and all the stuff you unlock there, but uh, if any of this happened to you, I'm sure a lot of you would be very mad. And uh, would I classify this as game breaking? No, but I, I think that this is still really bad. It's really bad that this is in the game and I hope this gets fixed ASAP. The worst I've seen involves characters clipping off stages for whatever reason. I have also heard that there are specific moves that are bugged that cause some characters to be way worse because of them. The main example I have is Goddard and all the bugs that seem to plague him. I hear if they got fixed then Jimmy would be more viable in competitive play. I don't pay attention much to what other glitches people have found. I can only really speak for myself and say that I haven't encountered many of them but when I have, they did have a significant impact on gameplay. 
Many of them required me to restart runs in the campaign or quit matches online. The game does run well otherwise, and I play on a Steam Deck. The only time I have performance issues is when I'm trying to record gameplay. Personally, I think the music in this game is awesome. I've heard people say that it is generic before, and I'm sorry, but that is just wrong. What you're about to listen to is objectively very good music. I can't begin to understand how you listen to this and say yeah, the music in this game isn't all that great, without elaborating a bit more. Of course I just pulled out one example of amazing music in this whole soundtrack, so how does the rest of it fare? I think most of the music that plays on stages is great. They are energetic, upbeat, and fit right into a fighting game. I think the music in the menus of this game are really good too. A standout of course is the main theme. It's got a rocking guitar with horns supporting it, along with drums that cut right through it and it's a bop. It has some slower parts, but you need that for a track as exciting as this one. I think the music that has the least impact is the stuff used in the campaign mode exclusively. Nothing really grabs me there, but I think that is the one apparent weak spot in the soundtrack. The only other valid complaint I can see about the soundtrack is that they do not use the exact melodies of the theme songs of each show. I personally think the soundtrack does a great job in replicating the styles of those theme songs to make new songs that sound just as good, if not better, than the original themes. Maybe this is a bit more subjective than I'm making it out to be, but I think this soundtrack is definitely better than the first games and it stands alongside the great soundtracks that many other fighting games usually have. Alright, now for the final topic of this video, I will go over the online. For me, at first, it worked very well. I got new opponents constantly, my connections were good for the most part, and I didn't experience many rollback hiccups. As the days went by, I noticed some problems. There were never times where the matches were laggy, and there were never any moments where the gameplay came to a halt for a very short or long period of time. However, there were instances of rollback that were so bad that I would just get flung off the stage and have my stock removed instantly. That's not fun at all. There were times where moves looked like they connected but didn't. There were also times where opponents just slightly teleported on my screen and it was hard to tell what movements they were going to do. I think as the servers got less crowded, things became better again. But that type of stuff was what I feared when I was waiting for the game. It's very hard to keep a player's attention nowadays if your online isn't perfect at launch. I think at this point, now that my issues have become less prominent, playing online is good outside of some of the problems I'll get to in a second. I do worry that when DLC content is added to this game, and people come in droves again, that the servers might not be able to handle it. I hope that I'm wrong though. That was the biggest problem with multiverses in my opinion. The servers always broke when new content dropped, and it probably discouraged many people from playing the game. The only other issues I've had with online is that it feels like my inputs do get eaten every now and then, and the matchmaking system in this game is not the best. When I say my inputs are being eaten, I mean that they just do not come out. I would just press buttons and sometimes that thing I want to do just doesn't happen. I have had times where I lose the advantage because of stuff like this, and it usually happens at least once a match. I had this problem in Smash Ultimate 2, which partially led me to being disenfranchised with that game. As for matchmaking, there were times where it would match me up with the same person over and over again, which is not fun if you just fought a sore loser or someone who is clearly on a higher level than you. It just wastes time. And unfortunately, the only way I could stop the matchmaking from doing this a lot of the time was to completely restart the game. One way I have circumvented this is to turn on crossplay in the settings. Now, the fact that crossplay is not turned on by default is incredibly stupid in my opinion. What is the upside of having it turned off? This isn't a shooter game where, like, PC players have a very clear advantage over console players, so why would you limit the amount of opponents a player can possibly find in this way? What was the point in implementing crossplay in the first place if you're just gonna risk a majority of your fanbase not knowing that there was a toggle for it 
and quitting the game because they are getting matched up with the same person. This is by far my biggest issue with the game, and it should be rectified in the future. Again, I had a fear going into this game that the crossplay would be jeopardized in some way, and here you go. I don't think a lot of people have talked about it and have taken this as a serious issue, but trust me, I will. <laughs> if people think that I'm over-exaggerating, then hey, by all means tell me that, but this is just my opinion. Crossplay being turned off by default combined with weird matchmaking issues is a recipe for disaster. I'm not even done talking about the other matchmaking issues I've had, by the way. One other issue I had was just times where the game had a weird loading screen where the prompt on the screen would go blank and the screen would start repeating an animation. In older patches, this resulted in a loading screen that felt infinite that could only be fixed by restarting the game. At least that's how it felt for me. When this visual glitch happens now, you usually can wait to get a game without restarting. And for me, when I try to look for public lobbies, I get nothing. Even with full Steam Deck integration, I have never seen an open lobby in this game besides for like the first week of it releasing. It could be entirely possible that there just aren't any lobbies available anytime I check, which is not a good sign. But that is everything that I wanted to go over, so let's get into an actual consensus. I really like Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2. It feels like the game I actually dreamt of when I saw trailers for the first game. There are many things in this game that are top-notch. There are other things that are not so top-notch and need work. I feel like the balancing in particular takes me away from wanting to play the game, and it has been like this since launch. To be realistic though, their priority should be on bug fixes and matchmaking changes right now before Mr. Crab releases. If they do that, then I think the game has a bright future ahead of it. The balancing can always be worked on after bugs aren't so prevalent, and I'm confident that it can be good by next year's end. And if all we get is a year of support for this game, then that would be alright, but for how much this game does right, it would be a shame if it didn't get built upon in some way through more updates or another sequel. If I had to rate the game, I'd probably give it a 7.5 out of 10. The only downsides for me right now are with the bugs, balance, and matchmaking of the game. Otherwise, I say it's probably the best platform fighter on the market in many ways. Of course, if you value a big roster over anything else, then Smash Ultimate is your game. But if you do value gameplay the most, I think this game is better than Smash Ultimate. At worst, you kind of deal with the same crap you have to in Ultimate, but at least in this game you have more options to get around the annoying stuff. I'd say the hardest part about this game is getting out of disadvantage, especially at the ledge. It can be a real struggle, and I kind of wouldn't mind if that changed but I kind of like the fact that this advantage is hard to get out of. In Smash Ultimate, it feels really easy to get back into neutral sometimes, and neutral and ultimate, oh man, that, that can get real boring. And even just downright annoying when the netcode is wonky and the delay is high. And even if I've had some issues with the online in this game, I can tell you 100% for sure, it is 10 trillion times better than any match I've ever had in Smash Ultimate. I think as an overall package, Nickelodeon All-Star Brawl 2 has been the best experience I've had with a platform fighter since Melee. It doesn't beat it, but still, I like it a lot. I would wait for a sale personally if you want to buy it. The first game went on sale a lot, so there's nothing wrong with waiting for a price drop, and I think that at 30 bucks, this game is well worth it. Thank you all for watching, don't forget to hit the like button if you haven't already, Thank you to my channel members StreamU, Salt Levels Max, Nuova, and Colby for your support. They got this video one day early, and they also get exclusive video content, funny emotes, and more on top of that. It's only $1.99 a month, but if you don't like subscriptions, you can donate to my coffee page instead to get the exclusive video content that way too. There are over 45 different videos to watch as I record this video, and the catalog only grows. If you just support me through watching and liking, I still appreciate you, and I hope to see you guys for my next big video project, where I'll be talking about why 2024 will be the actual year of Platform Fighters. Bye.